I'm wondering when this timer is going to start. Ah, it just started. OK. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, deal with what really is a universal thesis that scientific creativity entails a combinatorial process or procedure. I, by the way, I use those process and procedure because they're not exactly the same. So I want to be as inclusive as possible. Uh, we have introspective reports that deal with um, scientific creativity as being combinatorial. For example, Albert Einstein talked about combinatorial play as being the essential feature of productive thought. And by the way, in his day, that productive thought was the gestalt psychology term for creativity. Uh, we also have Poincaré, who talked about ideas arising in clouds, feeling them collide, uh, collide until pairs interlocked, making a stable combination. We also have psychological theories that emphasize um, combinatorial processes in creativity. Uh, a famous example is Sarnoff Mednick, who uh, talked about creative thinking process as the forming of associative elements into new combinations, which either meet specified requirements or in some way useful. The more mutually remote the elements of the new combination, and that's a key concept, uh, the more creative the process or solution. And this led to the ubiquitous uh, rat, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, and I might as well just have an editorial comment, is the worst operational definition of a theoretical struct ever devised in the history of psychology. Okay, but we don't have time to get into that. Um, and then we have artificial intelligence and computer simulation work that is explicitly combinatorial, and particularly the stuff uh, in evolutionary uh, alg algorithms. And finally, uh, if you look at the creative products themselves, they reveal that they're combinatorial. And a good example of that is Paul Thagard has analyzed uh, 100 great discoveries and 100 great inventions. These are, these are the top invention discoveries in history and show that each and every one can be analyzed into combinatorial components of one kind or another. Here I hope to develop this thesis for a way. Because like I said, this is nothing new, so I'm going to have to develop it to justify my existence up here, OK? Um, first, I formalize the various types of combinations, because not all combinations, nor even most, are in fact creative. And second, because uh, non-creative combinations may sometimes lead to creative combinations. And I'm going to give you two examples of that later on. Second, I will specify the mandatory connection between combinatorial creativity and what has been variably, uh, variably dis, uh, styled uh, trial and error, generate and test, or blind variation and selective retention. There's a essential connection. Third, I unify under a single specification all processes and or procedures that generate potentially creative combinations. And fourth, I work out the implications for distinct domains of creativity, and especially the contrast between scientific creativity and artistic creativity. There's some fundamental differences. I'm going to impose two constraints on my treatment. One, I focus on what's going inside of a single scientist's head, ignoring what also goes on in lab meetings and other forms of group-level brainstorming. So this is cognitive rather than social psychology, which is ironic because I got my degree in social psychology. Two, I concentrate on problem uh, solving. So that the interest largely concerns combinations that constitute solutions to problems regarding the phenomena, uh, such as identification, what is, it, what is it? Explanation, how does it work? Uh, oh, sorry. Um, prediction, what happens if? And invention, by what device can this be done? OK, now to the formalization. Um, given a particular problem, ideational or behavioral combinations are generated that present uh, potential solutions. And I'll give you some concrete examples, just, uh, uh, just so you can know what we're talking about here. Uh, Galileo applied his artistic training. A lot of people don't know it. He actually taught in art school before he became a scientist. Galileo applied his artistic training in Caroscuro to recognize that the dark and light patterns that he saw in his telescope on the moon, lunar, lunar surface, represented mountains. Uh, Isaac Newton integrating Galilean mechanics with Keplerian astronomy to produce a gravitational account of the solar system. Or Charles Darwin realizing that Malthusian population growth would cause a struggle for existence 
that would drive evolution via natural selection. Thomas Edison combining his telegraph and microphone inventions and thus converting the transcription of Morse code to the recording of sound. That was, by the way, was his favorite invention. Uh, and then finally, just to bring my tie in on it, uh, James Watson tinkering around with cardboard models of four nucleobases uh, to discover the, um, the DNA coding. He, ac he actually cut out cardboard models. It was amazing because they couldn't get the, the uh, regular molecular models in time. Okay, I now get a little bit more formal and I introduce uh, th three important parameters in describing combinations in the combinatorial process. At the instant that problem solving starts, combinations may be described by the following three parameters. And I really should have um, subscripts on these parameters, but to keep things simple, I'll leave the subscripts off. Uh, first, we have P, which is the combination's initial probability or response strength or latency at the instant you start working on a particular problem, okay? So this can range from zero to one inclusively, from, for example, not spontaneously generated during the initial session to generate it after a certain delay within the session uh, to instantaneously uh, generated. Then you have U, this is the combination's utility, like it's used in economics, the final utility, as a solution when finally fixing the product. There's a lot of debate about how utility can change. Utility doesn't change once you fix it in the product and submit it for publication. It's now fixed. And this also range from zero to one, inclusively, so from completely useless to merely satisfying to satisfying all criteria. And finally, and this is what's often overlooked, V, which is the prior knowledge of the final utility before generation. This also can range from zero to one inclusively. So you could be utterly ignorant of the final utility. You could have an educated guess or hunch, uh, and you could have a, just, a justified true belief. And I'll give you an example of what we mean by that in a moment. This yields an eightfold combination um, typology, which I'm gonna go over. And by the way, I just wanna mention, just this month, um, Cao, Ting, and Johnson from Sandia Laboratories in New Mexico have translated what I'm pre presenting today uh, into a kind of quasi-Bayesian framework. It's much more complicated, but it's really, really cool. Um, okay, here's the eightfold combination typology. I'm gonna use the symbol, uh, the arrow, uh, to represent nears the value of or approximates the value of. We start off with two expertise-driven combinations where V approaches one. That is, you already know that that combination has high utility. You know what the utility is. Well, not that it has high utility, but you know what the utility is, okay? And that means there's little knowledge to be gained in this particular combination. Uh, the most important example, the one you might think first, is where the initial probability approaches one, uh, the utility, final utility approaches one, and your prior knowledge of that utility approaches one. The probability is one, of course, because you know that the utility is one, all right? It's all, it all goes together. This is explicit expertise, like algorithmic solutions to a problem. Just do them automatically. And then what's often overlooked is another form of expertise. I call it implicit expertise, where certain combinations are ruled out of court. This is where the initial probability is zero, approaches zero, the utility approaches zero, and you know that the utility approaches zero. That's part of your expertise. What, this is like a scientist not even bothering any combination that involves um, contradicting the second or, th or first law of thermodynamics. And then we have two irrational combinations. I put this just to cover my bases because uh, uh, you know, people say, well, what about the two combinations you didn't talk about? Um, this is a case where you, you know what the utility is, but you ignore it, okay? So you're ignoring your knowledge. So one example is where the initial probability is very high, utility is very low, and you know it's low, but it's high probability anyway. This is irrational pers uh, uh, perseveration, and a lot of you may know that um, quote that's often attributed to Einstein, his, his definition of, of, a, of um, insanity, as doing the same thing over and over again, expecting it to come out different, that's irrational perseveration. And then we have irrational suppression, 
that's where the initial probability is zero, even though the utility is high and you know it's high. And this is most often, often happen when there's an extraneous bias that forces you to overlook something. You just can't accept it, okay? And then, and this is actually most important from the standpoint of understanding creativity, there's four blind combinations. They're blind in the sense that you don't know the utility in advance, so you're ignorant. Uh, one example is where the initial probability is very high, the utility is very high, but you didn't know that. You were totally ignorant of the utility in advance of generating. This is an example of like a lucky guess, where you really don't know what you're doing, or being right for the wrong reason. Another possibility is that the initial probability is very high, the utility is very low, and you don't know what the utility is, okay? Why would you do this? One illustration of this is problem finding. For example, you have a very good theory, it's well established, it makes a very solid prediction. You test that uh, prediction in the laboratory and it's just confirmed, okay? That's an example of this particular combination. And this is one of those non-creative combinations that lead to creativity because problem finding leads to problem solutions. A third possibility in the, in the blind realm is where all three parameters approach zero. This is a kind of a bizarre one when you think about it, but actually happens quite often. Hopefully it's not happening to any of you right now because one example is mind wandering, okay? Uh, you have low probability thoughts. They're often useless thoughts. And, and of course you don't have any prior knowledge. You're just kind of generating it. I, I call it random thinking, just you know, random thoughts, okay? Or it could be tinkering. You know, like tinkering away at a piano, or maybe some of you are dueling right now. That would be an example. But that can lead to the last combination, and we'll talk more about how, um, where the utility is actually very high. And this is a creative idea or response. And this actually leads me, accordingly, to a formal three criterion creativity definition. Most people in creativity research use two criteria. That is dead wrong, okay? You need three criteria, and I hope to convince you of that. Let one minus P, the initial probability, equal the originality. I'm just inverting it, and it makes sense. And then one minus P, inverting that too, um, let that equal surprise. That's the amount of new knowledge that you can obtain through that combination, okay? Then let a combination's personal creativity, because again, I'm talking about what's going on inside of a single scientist's head. Um, equal the joint product of originality, utility, and surprise. I just have a fancy representation of it, but it's just multiplying originality, utility, and surprise together. And this may seem exotic, but it's actually isomorphic with other people's definitions of creativity that you see from time to time. For example, Margaret Bowden talked about novel, valuable, and surprising when she talked about P creativity or psychological creativity. The U.S. Patent Office uses new, useful, and non-obvious, where the latter is in terms of ordinary skill in the art. And non-obvious non is just the opposite side of surprise. And then finally, uh, Teresa Mabale talked about novel, appropriate, and task heuristic rather than algorithmic, which actually can be translated into Vs that approach zero or Vs that approach one. I'll make three points. First, the standard def definition that only has two criteria that admits the V, the surprise one, is absolutely illogical. It makes no sense, okay? Uh, indeed, without V, I want you to think about this. Explicit expertise is indistinguishable from a lucky guess. They're equivalent. And that cannot be. You have to, in short, take in consideration people's prior knowledge going into the initial problem-solving situation. That's why I have that little frowning face because people keep on ignoring this, all right? This formal definition then leads to six implications that I think are very important in understanding uh, the creative process in science. First, personal creativity is a continuous variable. I mean, we all know this, it, but it, it ranges from zero to one according to this model, okay? From not creative at all to supremely creative. So we can talk about, for example, moderate creativity where P is equal to 0.2, where the utility is 0.8, so it's satisficing rather than perfectly satisfactory, and we have V equal to 0.5, this means you have a pretty good hunch about this particular combination. That yields a, a C of 
three two, which is about a third up the uh, hypothetical creativity scale. Okay, so that's sort of a, an example. Second, whenever creativity is a lot less than one, which I would argue is the usual case, and I'll, I'll get a Monte Carlo simulation later to show that, the creativity of a solution may represent an infinitely varied mixture of values for originality, utility, and surprise. Sometimes one would be emphasized, sometimes another would be emphasized. Yet the qualitative nature or character of the creative solution will differ depending on which of the three criteria it dominates. A good example is applied research versus theoretical research or pure research in the sciences. They emphasize different components of what it means to be creative. Third, given multiplicative rather than additive integration, each criterion becomes a necessary but not sufficient basis for personal creativity. If any factor equals zero, then their product equals zero. This is just basic math, okay? Uh, for example, if you decide to invent a perpetual motion machine of the first or second kind, I can guarantee you that it has zero utility because it violates the first two, uh, uh, yeah, the first two laws of thermodynamics. And, um, and therefore, the, uh, because the utility is zero, creativity has to be zero. Notice I put V is equal to one because I know that to be the case. In fact, you, a lot of you may know that uh, the US Patent Office no longer accepts patent applications for perpetual motion machines. They just rule them out of court, okay? Fourth, whenever the utility is greater than zero at some fixed value, and whenever the prior knowledge of that utility is less than one at some fixed value, and this is an interesting point, creativity maximizes when P equals zero. What that means is, is this, that although an incubation period is not required to generate creative solutions, those solutions that do require incubation because the initial probability is zero, will tend to be more personally creative, okay? That comes out of the math. Therefore, Wallace, a lot of you know about Wallace's four stages of, of preparation, incubation, illumination, and verification. And this is based on experiences of various famous scientists, uh, such as Hermann von Helmholtz. There's justification to that, because he's really talking about the most outstanding discoveries or inventions usually have incubation periods associated with it but you don't have to have an incubation period. If you, if you come up with an idea during the first session or during the lab meeting, it's okay, your idea is still creative. It's just not a breakthrough idea. Yet creativity is largely uncorrelated with incubation's temporal duration because the latter is contingent upon chance external stimuli and internal associations, uh, what has sometimes been called um, constraints to asceticity. God, I'm amazed, amazed I was able to pronounce that. For example, Archimedes' famous Eureka experience would not have produced a more creative solution to the gold crown problem had he delayed taking a bath a day or more. He would have got the same result, okay? Fifth, given multiplicative rather than additive integration, creative solutions are far more rare than non-creative solutions. This is why it's hard to be creative. That's why it takes so long to find that good idea for a dissertation topic or something that's gonna be published in the top tier journal because creative ideas are rare. Uh, let me give you a, a simple Monte Carlo uh, simulation which gives, uh, uh, took the values of three parameters and randomly generated them. And actually, you can, it doesn't matter how you do it, by the way. You, you can use a random normal devi uh, deviates or you can use rectilinear uh, uh, random numbers. You get the same results because the key is is how you put the, the, money, uh, the values together. Um, so you may know the central limit theorem that if you add things together, you get a normal distribution, but if you multiply them together, you get a distribution like this, okay? Um, it's like an inverse power distribution. So uh, you have frequency on the horizontal axis, I mean, the vertical axis, and, and then creativity on the horizontal axis, and all the unoriginal, useless, and ops, uh, obvious solutions are on the right side of the graph, and they're very, very common. It's very, they're very, very easy to get, okay? And then on the other end, the highly creative solutions, the solutions that are original and useful and surprising, using and, you know, in the conjunctive logical sense, are extremely rare. Sixth and last, 
Because the solution utilities for creative combinations are unknown or incompletely known, I mean, sometimes V is greater than zero, in advance of the generation of the potential solutions, then those solutions must undergo a second step of directed evaluation or assessment. Uh, this has been called various things. Uh, Bain, way back in 1855, called it trial and error. We already mentioned that Wallace called it illumination and, and, and verification. Uh, it's often called generation and test. I've been trying to find out who first came up with that. And if anybody knows, I'd be glad to know. I found one paper that used it in the early 70s, but had no citation for it. So it may have been just in the air, like the zeitgeist or something. And then Popper called it uh, conjecture and refutation. Uh, my favorite term is, comes from Donald Campbell, who is my doctoral grandfather, blind variation and selective retention. And then B.F. Skinner had this idea of spontaneous behavior plus selection by consequence. He didn't talk much about spontaneous behavior. I'm gonna go ahead and put him in there. And this two-step process, the second step of it, can take two forms. Uh, you can have uh, external or scenario where you're testing it, your, uh, your combination directly against the external world. You go into a lab and you, and you test it in your laboratory to see if you get the result predicted. Or you can also, if you have a good representation of external reality inside your head, you can test it internally. And Einstein loved to do that through his Gedanken experiments. He would, do, he would test his ideas inside his head. Uh, very seldom, well, I don't think he ever went to a laboratory. Okay, to illustrate, let us define a potential solution attribute called sightedness, just opposite of blindness, okay, using the three parameters, namely sightedness, or S, equals P times U times V. So it equals one when all those other parameters are equal one. In other words, that's basically a index of explicit expertise. Then another simple Monte Carlo simul uh, uh, simulation yields the following sc uh, scattergram. Now we have creativity on the vertical axis, sightedness or expertise uh, on the horizontal axis. Notice that we have very few kernels of wheat at the top and lots of chaff at the bottom that we have to weed through. So we have to use BBSR or trial and error or whatever you want to call it. I don't care what the name is. And just to give you a qualitative representation of this graph, I can quote Albert Einstein, who said, if we knew what we're doing, we wouldn't call it research. Okay? He's talking about the blind end of this distribution, all right, where he has to do research. And most of my intellectual offspring end up very young in the graveyard of disappointed hopes. Of course, we don't know that because that stuff isn't published. Although every once in a while it would be. He had one thing published, and he was told, Einstein, you overlook something. According to your theory, the universe wouldn't exist. My, he didn't think that part out, okay? And it wouldn't exist because charged particles wouldn't be affected by electromagnetic fields, according to his theory. Hilarious. Okay, but then you're probably asking, where do these potential combinatorial solutions originate in the first place? The answer is, whatever works, okay? To me, many of Fire Abend in uh, Against Method talked about um, anything goes. Researchers have proposed an impressive number of combinatorial generators that can feed potential solutions into the selection hopper. Remote association, divergent thinking, cognitive inhibition, uh, uh, disinhibition, blah, 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 blah. Janusian homospatial step con articulation thinking. Now, I'll leave the stuff in between as a homework assignment, okay? Um, what do you use? Okay, there's no free lunch. Some of you may have heard the no free lunch theorems, okay? All works some of the time. We know that, it's been documented. None works all the time. And there's no telling beforehand which will work best. Okay, you're stuck, all right? That's again, another reason why creativity is hard, all right? Even so, each and every generator shares one key characteristic. The capacity to generate low probability potential solutions with unknown or incompletely known utility values. So the initial probability approach is zero. The prior knowledge of the utility approach is zero. But the utility could be anywhere in between because you can't select because you don't know what you're doing. You're doing research. 
And then the latter ignorance then requires a chili evaluation or test. Even highly inspired eureka moments, acceptable utility is by no means guaranteed. Hence, Wallace is justified in adding the verification stage after the illumination stage to accommodate oh shucks events. Right? This, such a requirement increases with the complexity of the utility criteria, utility function. Just think about what counts as a useful model of DNA. That's a really complex utility function. Um, two phenomena illustrate the exceptional circumstance under which highly creative ideas are often generated in the sciences. We have an internal circumstance of mind wandering, or what Margaret Bowden called the bed, the bath, the bed, and the bus. Because the initial probability approaches zero, the prior knowledge value approaches zero, and the utility could be anywhere in between. And as a consequence, a creative combination can be spontaneously generated when engaged in some mundane or semi-alert activity, like taking a bath, waking up in bed, or boarding a bus. And then we have an external circumstance of serendipity. And there's many, many classic examples of this, penicillin, electromagnetism, x-rays, the phonograph, ozone, and so, and so forth. And the parameters here are very, very distinctive. Um, P equals V equals zero exactly. In true serendipity, both of those are exactly equal to zero. But the utility approach is one, OK? In other words, you have a highly useful combination that could be neither spontaneously generated nor anticipated by the person. I mean, a good example is Fleming's discovery of the antibacterial effects of uh, penicillin mold, okay? He never would in a million years put some penicillin spores in his bacterial cultures to see what happened. He never thought of doing that. He had no reason to think there would be a reason to. Okay, but what if you've all heard uh, a pastor talking about, well, chance that favors the prepared mind. The scientist obviously has to have the expertise to evaluate the original utility and surprise of what is discovered through serendipity. Now, the final question is, how does scientific creativity differ from artistic creativity? Uh, combinatorial processes and procedures permeate all forms of creativity, even in the arts. The uh, latter is evident from multiple sources, introspective reports, uh, theoretical model. Obvious. They're sampling from different domains. So they're, the combinatorial mechanisms are being applied to different uh, mental elements and uh, behaviors. Like Einstein and Picasso didn't uh, com combine the same elements. And there's also some difference between the domains on whether they're open to extra domain influences. Like Picasso was influenced by the Guernica atrocity and it got a pain out of it and it had no impact on Einstein's unified field theory. Okay. Finally, the scientific consensus is different than you find in the arts. Personally assessed little c creativity, which is what we've been mainly talking about, more strongly corresponds with consensually assessed big c creativity. There will be some agreement between you and your peers on the creativity of your ideas. I have 17 seconds left, so I'm not going to tell you what that formula is about. Questions?
Oh, by the way, I'm going to prime you. Um, like, anybody have a question about combinatorial explosions? Because everybody talks about that as a main objection to combinatorial theories of creativity. <laughs> I, I just discovered I came in line, so I'll go. Okay. Uh, my question. Hello. Okay, I think it's on. Uh, my question uh, relates to this idea of how much of our thinking of a, what creativity is is driven on looking at the work from a group of people who look very similar. So mostly Western white men who have been writing in the last few hundred years. And so is our thinking about the scientific, the, sorry, the, the science of creativity driven on how that narrow group of people did it? Uh, I mean, that's a good question. It's a reasonable question. I don't think there is much difference as people think in the evaluation of creativity. Uh, I have been doing cross-cultural research ever since, in fact, my first publication was published in the journal of cross-cultural psychology. And so I've tested a lot of my theories, uh, not only in different cultures, like, uh, for example, in addition to Western culture, Chinese culture, Japanese culture, and most recently, I have a paper last year on Islamic civilization. And I don't see any major differences. There's often differences in emphasis that are similar to what I talked about before. It, uh, most creativity occurs in a low level, you know, like a 0 0.32 level. Very few, except for breakthroughs, are very high. And so what that means is there's gonna be a different mix of originality, utility, and surprise. And some cultures put much more emphasis on one or another. Our culture is one that puts a big emphasis on originality. And others put much more emphasis on utility. You know, what's the point of just being original? You know? Uh, so I think there's some changes in emphasis but I, I don't see any reason to say that creativity becomes a fundamentally different thing, particularly since basically we all have the same brain, whatever the culture happens to be. We all have the same brain, and that brain is operating in the cultural materials that we are using. Over here. Hey, um, uh, so if you think of uh, deduction as, as being sort of based on, on combining ideas that in some sense are already known and induction as, as having to do with coming up with sort of new abstractions, um, does that distinction enter into creativity as you're sort of formalizing it? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, because deduction, people say you, everything you deduce was already known, okay, like you said. And of course, Plato's solution to that is that uh, it's already known because you were actually born with the ideas to begin with. Um, but to me, that's in some respects empirical. It's almost like, it, because what you're trying to do in, in deduction is figure out the implications that you don't know. And you may not even know where it goes. I mean, a good example is you know, the, the, the recent thing about um, you know, the, a final proof for, for Mont's last theorem at first, it wasn't clear where all these various theorems were going. And all of a sudden, it became very, very apparent that Fermat's last theorem would be a special case of one particular general theorem that they had discovered. So to me, it's, they're very, very similar, even though you have different rules of manipulation in the two. Sure. You're giving Thank me exercise. You. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I wonder if you could um, help to flesh out our intuitions on the surprise component. I take it that the surprise component is the surprise for the individual who's generating the idea. Right. And it seems like that, uh, that puts people with expertise at a uh, major disadvantage for creativity because it seems like they would be less likely, they're, they're gonna have less surprise. Well, no, I mean, what, what people wanna do is they wanna make contribu contributions to a domain, okay? And you can't make a contribution to a domain if all you're doing is um, applying standard expertise. It's, it's like the, the definition that the uh, post office uh, uses, uh, you know, ordinary skill in the art. If you already know what you're doing, then you're not being creative. Okay, so I don't think there's any disadvantage. In fact, you actually have an advantage. It gets back to that 
you know, my answer to, um, uh, to uh, Pasteur's, you know, chance favors the prepared mind, you have to be able to evaluate whether this result is really surprising or not. That really constitutes a, a, something new, a, a bit of a, a, a advanced. Now, sometimes you could be wrong because one of the saddest stories in the history of science is Max Planck, before he discovered, you know, his Planck's constant and, you know, all that kind of stuff, uh, he reinvented the wheel. He didn't realize that thermodynamics had already been invented. So he came up with these really brilliant ideas, and then, and then someone told him, I don't remember the exact circumstances, um, here's some books you can read on that, okay? So you need the expertise to be able to know whether something is surprising or not, and therefore marks a contribution to your field. Thank you. Yeah. We go back and forth. Yeah. So yeah. So, so, so <laughs> in general, I mean, it's a pretty naive comment and the most likely naive question. But uh, because I personally consider, you know, creativity is a state of mind. It's more like love. And love you can describe with constants, you know. That, but you know, you, we still don't know what it is. So the question, more specific, is then: uh, if you have this component of mind wandering, bed bath, and uh, beyond, <laughs> very familiar. Probably I will come up with a better question you know, tomorrow morning as I brush my teeth. But how do you know that what happens during this process, that somebody hits you, had you in a dream and so on, how do you know that this process was simply merely recombining something? I mean, if it's hidden from us, what's happening? As you said at the beginning, you're interested in what's happening in the human brain. But how do you know that what's happening is truly combinatorial well, or mean, something uh, really inductive, uh, creating something anew. Because uh, one of the reasons why we know is that because the products themselves reveal that there are combinations of things that we knew before that we didn't know were connected. Difference. The product can be truly a combination of the preceding products, but it doesn't necessarily mean that creating this combination is a combinatorial process, like I'm sitting and recombining like Jim Watson. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand that because I think what, what you may be doing is, re, is having a very narrow definition of what counts as a combinatorial process. Because I see there's a whole bunch of different kinds of combinatorial processes. Some of them are explicit procedures that we can use, and some are implicit things that we can only investigate kind of indirectly, you know, like the remote association process is a kind of an implicit process, and we can investigate that, and we actually can learn about how, you know, we get intermediate products, you know, we just connect two um, associates, but not all three, things like that. So we know there's combinations going on there that we can study, but um, we have to do it very indirectly. Uh, I, 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 it's hard for me to imagine, Chris, it could be just pure dogmatism on my part, but it's hard for me to imagine how you can get a combinatorial product without engaging some combinatorial process or procedure. That's just my view. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, thanks. Um, so I'm trying to see if I can articulate this question right. I'm kind of grappling with time, how time plays a role in this, and, and a bit on the utility front in particular. It's a little easier for me to, to digest. So it, it, a good example would be I, it's, it's kind of like the post hoc creativity, right? We, we look back behind us and we say, oh, they were really creative in what they did. But at the time, we didn't appreciate it. And you can right. imagine utility being a great example. Somebody goes off, they do something, the utility factor is, near zero because there's nothing. There's but remember no, no we're, and then it changes over time. And it's, it's kind of the fact, I think I appreciate that it, it's in the context. It's more the fact of like, how does this play out in terms of time? Because time is a factor in all of this. Right. And, and, and all the factors, I think, but I'm, I'm trying to wrap all how, what you, or at least what your thoughts are on that. Well, yeah, that okay. Sense. Remember, that's one reason why I put it in the context of problem solving. You have, a, you have a problem you want to solve. You want to find out what the structure of DNA molecule is, okay? and you have a number of uh, utility criteria, and um, you have a hunch that's something you want to check out, uh, maybe how the, the nuclear bases could go together, and at the end of your research, you finally have a utility estimate. That's the best estimate you have that you're willing, if the utility is high enough, to publish. And this is why I say the final product, once you decide that this is the idea that's gonna go in the final product, utility function, the, the utility value is fixed. 
You can't change them. Okay. Now, this is kind of an interesting thing, of course, because it's obviously more complicated than that, because you submit it for publication, the reviewers send it back and they tell you, you got your utility function wrong, okay? You overlooked this criterion. So I, I admit this is gonna change over time, but what I'm saying, at the time you decide, this is it, I got it, then that's when you're done measuring utility. All right, thank you. Thanks. Uh, my question is that as far as I know, uh, theory is also a part of science, but you didn't mention theory, you only mentioned inventions uh, and what, uh, another component. And I'm just wondering that uh, is a, a creative theory is also a combination of some other theory or some other stuff? You're asking, asking if... Um... A creative theory is Theory, you didn't mention theory. What's the relationship between theory and uh, combination? Like does new theory also need combination of stuff? The, the theory of creativity that I'm proposing is a combinatorial theory that is a combination of prior theories, if that's... But, 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 you, but you said invention and discovery, but you didn't mention theory. Theory, scientific theory is also another component of science, right? There is another component of science, yeah. But, but you didn't mention it in this framework. I'm just wondering, does this exclu exclude theory from this framework? Doesn't work to theory or? Well, it applies to both theory and invention. I guess I don't, and discovery. I, I mean, you're obviously combining different things, you know, when you're, um, you know, sometimes you're combining responses. You know, like when, um, I mean, my favorite, best favorite example is like improvisation on the piano. You just sit at the piano and you start playing and you really don't have any idea in mind, but uh, you, you're using basic motor memory to all of a sudden come up with some melodies. But uh, the particular product, there's all sorts of modalities you'll be using. There's all sorts of different um, substantive domains you'll be relying on. And they'll vary you know, across you know, whether you're working on theory or whether you're working on inventions or whatever. I don't know if that really answers your question. I'm not trying to evade it. I'm trying to understand it. So yeah, yeah maybe we can talk later. So. Yeah, I mean, we'll have plenty of time. I won't. I won't. I won't. I won't avoid you. I promise you. Okay. <laughs> okay. So thanks for the talk. It's really a fascinating topic. I I have actually two short questions. Like the first one is I'm not sure. Whether I agree with the fact that creativity has to be always related with um, a new way of doing things. Like, say, you put the example of, like, well, most of the papers use just boilerplate statistical treatments, blah, and these things. And it's true that that's not very creative, but very often the creativity is in what exactly you are asking. So sometimes it's the question rather than how you are answering the question. So sometimes, like, the data has been there forever, the methods are the same, but the way you are framing the problem well, is what makes very, it That's creative. very creative. Huh? That is very creative to that come is. up with a new problem, you know, or a new way of, of phrasing a problem so that it becomes uh, answerable. Uh, if you look at some of the um, combinatorial procedures, one of them is, like, reframing or changing yeah. perspective. On, on, on a, on a problem, or sometimes realizing you know, a problem is not a problem. That's, that's the creative solution. Okay. Yeah. Like, so, like a stall, so we, agree, we, we agree on that. Okay, okay. So, <laughs> so the, second, the second one is, it's related to, to time, like the question that was two questions before me, I think. Yeah. And it's more about how time affects the surprise effect. So say, for instance, like DNA, the discovery of DNA that you mentioned, I mean, the, it happened like the way they framed it because they saw the diffraction images from Rosalind Franklin. Mm -hmm. Without it, like really, they 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 didn't have that much clue, but they saw them, right? They, I mean, I'm sure you know the story, right? They saw them and they were kind of like, oh, this matches what what she sees, so it has to be right, right? As opposed to the other structures that have been proposed by Pauli or by, by others before them. And it happens also with other things that they are not possible until it's technologically possible to do those things because, because before, before the prior knowledge existed, just like the surprise is like infinite, well, it's one in your case, but it changes because like technology makes it possible. So how do you put this, like how, I mean, have you considered putting this sort of effect of, of how like surprise changes because of like, 
the knowledge that is in there, right? Some things cannot happen. Well, I mean, happen. obviously, all these things, remember, the, the key to understanding the, um, the parameters for defining creativity is it's all at a particular moment in time in history and in the biography of that person. And uh, the values are going to change at other times. That's why I, this, I, I, I prefer in my publications to actually have the subscripts because one of the key subscripts is key, okay? And that's going to make it, make it so the value is going to change over time. And, um, and then another value is, the per, is for the, the, the person, and then another value is for the particular combination. So all, all three of those parameters vary according to time, person, and the particular combination that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, but I left, the, I left that out. This, I, is, this will have to be our last question. So the uh, you, rest. You have 11 seconds. Yeah. Uh, speak um, during the break. <laughs> So how do we evaluate the utility of your theory, and is it disprovable? Uh, actually, this is part of a larger theory, uh, a larger combinatorial theory. And, I, and what, I, what you do to evaluate is you work out the implications of the theory, and then you see whether or not you get results that are consistent with data. And my favorite part of theory is the part of theory I didn't even talk about here that uh, I've been working on since 1978, actually, a long time. And that has to do with the phenomenon of multiple discovery and invention, where two or more people come up with the same idea, often simultaneously, but not necessarily. And uh, I have been developing a combinatorial model, model of that, and it's beautiful, because it makes very, very specific predictions. It makes predictions, for example, that the distribution of multiple grades, how many people uh, make the same contribution, is going to be described by a Poisson distribution. Um, you get a similar distribution for the distribution of time lapses between um, duplicate discoveries, okay? You also find that um, quantity, quality is a, is a function of quantity so that the more discoveries you make, the higher the probability you're gonna get involved in a multiple. It's totally probabilistic. So one of the ways you test the utility of a theoretical model is to see, first of all, if it can explain things, you know, and, this, and, and, and unified disparate areas of a, of a field, but also see if you can actually make predictions. And I've also made predictions with regard to individual differences in creative output and how that output changes across time, which is actually a nice lead in to the next, there you are, the next talk. Okay. okay. <laughs>